So we'll do this uh, 16 pi over 7. Now, we haven't really seen sevenths before. So this is not an angle that we're familiar with. And I can tell that it's a lot of pi's over 7. So we're going to label in sevenths now. So normally I would label on the left as pi, but we're going to keep it in sevenths. So we got 7 pi over 7 right there. So that takes us halfway around the circle. And if I go all the way around the circle, I get 14 pi over 7. Unfortunately, I still have two more pi over 7s to go. So the question is, how much further does 2 pi over 7 take me? So one thing to keep in mind, I'm going to draw pi over 3 in, which is also known as 2 pi over 6. So fractions, if you don't have common denominators, fractions make your head hurt. So this is one of the few times I'm going to compare fractions that have different denominators. Which fraction is bigger, 2 pi over 7 or 2 pi over 6? 2 pi over 6 is bigger. Now, the only reason I can compare these easily is because the numerator is the same. Not normally how I recommend comparing fractions. Probably the best way to do it is if I went to common denominator, I would get 40 seconds. I think I could write this out with 40 seconds in the denominator. And then I would get a direct comparison. So what this tells me is 2 pi over 7 is going to be a little bit short of 2 pi over 6. So it's going to be somewhere right about, and I'll switch to blue. Let's just say it's right about there. I don't know exactly where it's at, but it's a little less than the 2 pi over 6. So if I did this full, now I'm writing on top of other writing. So I'll write 2 pi over 6 right there. It's the same angle we labeled a minute ago. And now we'll do the spiral up to there. And that is 16 pi over 7. So that full loop plus that little bit more. So now the question is, what angle, what is my reference angle? So how many pi over 7's is that? So we get 2 pi over 7, because we just went 14 plus there was 2 more to hit 16 pi. So we got 2 pi over 7 is our reference angle. So any questions on getting this reference angle? We got a little bit lucky in the sense that it was in quadrant 1. So the reference angle is usually a little easier to think about in quadrant 1 than it is in the other quadrants. Now the denominator was really strange, so it took a while to figure that one out. How about other reference angle questions that you got stuck on? So th this point is going to be really tricky to find because we haven't looked at pi over 7's at all. Okay. So I wouldn't, on this angle, because there's 7's, I wouldn't ask you about what's the point on the circle. Okay, I'm not worried about that. Okay. It was pi over 6, that's a different story. If it was 2 pi over 6, you should be able to tell me the xy coordinates. Mm -hmm. So anything that's in thirds, fourths, sixths, or halves, you should be able to figure out any of those xy coordinates on the circle. Anything that's in an obscure denominator, like 7, 8, all those other ones. Is there like an equation to do that? Or? We will do uh, some of those in, in weird algebraic ways okay. that we will get, definitely get to. So let's do one more reference angle question. And then I forgot what the second part of this page I find. It's like 
so Was it similar to this example where they told you like sine was negative and tangent was negative? And yeah, I think so. So on these, uh, they'll usually give you two clues. One of them will be um, a trig function value and the other one's a different trig function value and based on the positive and negative of those two. So each trig value, if you know a trig value is positive, that uh, narrows it down to two quadrants, different for each of the trig values. So sine is a y value, so in the previous example, the y value is less than zero. That puts us down in quadrant, the bottom quadrants. So that'd be three and four. Tangent's kind of tricky. Tangent is negative in quadrant two and four. And tangent will be positive in, everybody's positive in one, but tangent's positive in one and three. And so sine is the y coordinate, so sine's positive at the top, negative at the bottom. Cosine's the x coordinate. So if I drew a cosine, uh, cosine would be negative in quadrant two and three. That's where cosine would be negative. So you have to just go through and figure out what quadrants are in common right there. And sh it should narrow it down to one quadrant. So I could answer a homework question on reference angles. Um, there's a reference angle question that says like the reference angle of 100 degrees is and then it says like of 350 degrees or of 4. So let's do a, let's work with 100 degrees. I don't think I did any degree reference angle questions. So this will be our first degree reference angle here. So when we're in degrees, we need to label everything in degrees. So I don't want to use radians at all here. So what is the top angle, the first angle we hit? 90. So that's 90, and that's really close to 100. So I'm going to go ahead and just write in 180 for the half rotation. So now it should be pretty clear where 100 is. 100 is between 90 and 180. It's pretty close to 90. So it's going to look about like that right there. So there's our 100 degrees. I can draw the reference angle in. It's that angle right there. It's the shortest angle to the x-axis. So it's definitely the one going to the left and going around. What, and I'll call it theta bar. So I want to write an equation that, such that two of these angles add up to a third angle. So what two angles add up to 180 degrees? Ninety is not one of them, so it's the other two angles. 100 plus theta bar is 180. So 100 plus theta bar is 180 degrees. Just looking at this unit circle, Rotate 100 degrees, and then rotate another theta bar, and you'll have gone halfway. So that's how you want to think about this. You add rotations by just doing one rotation and then doing the other one. So go 100 degrees and another theta bar, and you have 180. Now you just solve for theta bar now. So 180 minus 100, you get 80 degrees. And that's your reference angle. So, any other questions from 10 to? Can we do like a reference angle with a whole number of radians? Yep. So, I think I did a five before, but we'll do one more example from that.
So I'm not going to use the numbers that are actually in your homeworks, but I'll use numbers that are similar in the process is very similar. So how do I know this is not degrees? What would you always see if your problem's in degrees? A degree sign. So you'll see a degree sign. So if I ever write an angle measure and I don't write a little degree symbol or write out degrees, you know it's in radians. So always think things are in radians unless you see a degree. All right, so in radians, now I don't see a pi, so if I start labeling my unit circle with pi's everywhere, that's not very relatable back to the decimal number seven. So what I'm going to do instead is use decimal approximations. 3.14, 6.28. If you're super, super lazy, you can just do 3.1 and 6.2. That's good enough for us. That's close enough. Just from this really rough uh, estimate, how does 7 compare to 2 pi? So a little, seven is a little bit bigger, so it's going to rotate a little bit more than one full rotation. Now I want to make sure that it's not going to rotate. Is it going to stop in quadrant one on the second lap, or is it going to stop in quadrant two? I want to be a little bit careful about that. So let's write out. This is normally five pi over two. Uh, the first lap is pi over two, but the second lap it's uh, five pi over two. And I want to write a decimal approximation for 5 pi over 2. So it's going to be 6.2 plus another about 1.5. That's a pi over 2, approximation for pi over 2. So that's 7.7. .7. So this 5 pi over 2 is close to 7.7. .7. So 7 is not going to get, make it into the quadrant 2. It's going to stop in quadrant 1. I don't know exactly where it's going to stop in quadrant 1, but somewhere in quadrant 1 it will stop. So any questions about getting these uh, decimal approximations? I recommend just use two digits. 3.14, 6.28, I think it's 1.57 if you use three digits. All right, I still haven't written the reference angle. I can certainly draw it in green. It's not green. Now it's going to be a little bit tricky to find. So original angle was theta. What would I get if I did theta minus theta bar? Now when I subtract angles, adding angles you rotate once and then rotate the second angle. Subtracting says rotate your first angle and then turn your second angle backwards or rotate the opposite way. What would I get if I did a full, the full theta rotation and then came back theta bar? So I would get that 6.28, or to be precise, I would get 2 pi. So I would get one full rotation if I subtracted these two angles. So I'll write that out in the orange marker here. So that would be go around one full rotation, go theta, but then come back theta bar. So it's a full spiral and then come back theta bar. And then all you have to do is solve for theta bar. So we will, oh, and I can put in 7 for theta. And then we're just doing some algebra here. I'll add theta bar to the other side. And then subtract 2 pi. So there is our reference angle. And your reference angle is going to seem a little strange because it's going to be that integer number you got, in this case it was 4, on the example you have, I think they used 3 and, uh, three and 4 in the web work example, but here's an example with 7. Uh, previously in the notes I did one with 5, I think, so that one might help as well. Now web work wants the exact value, so use 2 pi, don't just use 6.28. 6.28 would be an estimate, it would be close, but this one would be exact right here. 
the only reason I use estimates is to figure out uh, what quadrant would theta land in. If I got the quadrant wrong, I would definitely get the wrong expression at the end. So now we'll jump back to 10.3. So we did finish this example here. We're going to do another example where I give you some trig values, and I don't tell you what theta is, and I want you to get other trig values. So in this last example, we did figure out what quadrant theta was in, but we never wrote down what actual theta was. So I didn't ask what theta was, and we didn't need to find it. Did I write down Sokotoa already? No. I sure didn't. So that's a good time to write that down. We're gonna, this next problem is going to be really similar, but we're going to solve it in a different way. So this is called triangle trigonometry. So I'm going to intentionally write this triangle not lined up on the xy axis. We have an adjacent, an opposite side, and a hypotenuse. So this triangle does not need to be laid out perfectly on the x axis. Also, the hypotenuse does not necessarily need to equal 1. So cosine theta is adjacent over hypotenuse. Sine theta is opposite over hypotenuse. Tangent theta is opposite over hypotenuse. So these are the three. Oh yeah, absolutely. Good thing you're here. Opposite over adjacent. Absolutely. Uh, the way you can memorize this is, for some reason, it's written with sine first. So, katoa. So that just goes sine opposite over hypotenuse. S O A or S O H, and then C A H. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, and tangent is opposite over adjacent. So it's an acronym for what we wrote above. And if we write down the secant, cosecant, cotangent, those are the reciprocals of what we just wrote down. So secant is hypotenuse over adjacent. Cosecant is hypotenuse over opposite and cotangent adjacent over opposite. So we're going to use this. Uh, this is what I call drawing a triangle. And we're going to draw a triangle to solve a very similar problem. So we're going to start out with Tangent, given tangent of theta is one half. Given tangent theta is one half and sine is less than zero. Bind cos theta and sine theta. So what we're going to do is draw a triangle that has the right values from the sides, 
But before we do that, we need to draw the triangle in the correct quadrant. So we're going to find the quadrant of theta first. So tangent's positive. What quadrants is tangent positive in? So tangent is positive in one and three. What quadrants is sine negative in? So sine is negative in three, and what other quadrant? Three and four. So that's the bottom half of the circle. So sine is negative in three and four, and of course the common quadrant is 3. So they're both negative in quadrant 3. So our angles in quadrant 3 right here and we're gonna draw a triangle always go back to the x-axis so there's where our triangle is going to live. Now I'm going to redraw the triangle way bigger here We have theta, the right angle, and we're going to have opposite and adjacent. And hypotenuse. So tangent is opposite over adjacent. So opposite is 1 adjacent is 2. Should my sides be both positive or both negative in quadrant 3? They should both be negative. Now that's a little bit in disguise. 1 half is the same as negative 1 divided by negative 2. So sometimes they could both be negative and it's kind of hiding. So we're in quadrant 3. That was important to know. Both of my sides are actually negative because we're in quadrant 3. So that means I have negative x and negative y. So when I divide, I get positive. So now we know adjacent and opposite. How do I get the hypotenuse? So we got a right triangle, and we want to know how the sides are related, so we have Pythagorean theorem. So hypotenuse squared is adjacent squared plus opposite squared. We know the adjacent is negative 2 squared plus negative 1 squared. So we have 4 plus 1 equals 5. That's the hypotenuse squared. So the hypotenuse is square root 5. Hypotenuse is always going to be positive. We're never going to uh, write a negative hypotenuse. So hypotenuse is going to be greater than zero always, no matter what quadrant you're in. Even if it's pointing straight down or straight up, we will say our hypotenuse is always going to be positive. All right, so we know all the measurements of the triangle. We're ready to write down uh, cosine and sine now. So cosine, so that's C-A-H, so it's adjacent. over hypotenuse. So our cosine is negative 2 over square root 5. And sine is similar, it's just opposite over hypotenuse. And our opposite is negative 1 over square root 5. So there's our cosine and sine values. So these are basic identities, and now we're going to get into more uh, 
algebraic identities. So I have a separate section in the notes, but it's still 10.3 from the book. So before we start talking about fundamental identities, I should talk about what an identity is. So two functions are identically equal if, of course, if fx equals gx, but if they're equal for all x values. Um, not just for all x values, but all x values in the domain, and the domains of the two functions better be the same. So for all x values, x in the domain of f, and domain f needs to be exactly the same as the domain of g. So it doesn't matter which one I pull the x's from, because they need to be exactly the same. So this is the idea of identically equal. So I'll do one example of not identically equal. Is there an x value that makes both sides of this equation the same? One, one works. Is there another x value? Yeah. Zero. What about x equals any other number? They're not the same thing. So these are not identically equal because, uh, for example, negative 1 makes them different. And all the negative numbers make them not equal. Um, and any positive value that's not 1 makes these not equal, 2, 3, 4. So these are not equal for most x values. And so this is what we call not identically equal. So they're not the exact same thing on both sides. So they're not equal for all other x values. So this next example will be identically equal. So I'll do an easy example. So go ahead and FOIL the right side and try to rewrite the right side. So FOIL this right side. And you should get x squared minus 1. So what does that tell you? Uh, no matter what x value you choose, you'll get the same number if you plug in on either side of this equation. So all x values, when you plug in any x value on the left, you get the same output as you get if you plug in that x value on the right side. So these are the same for every single x value. Uh, next example of equality. We'll do once even easier. Uh, 
That one should be even easier to see, easier factoring. So you just do an easy algebra move, like factoring. You'll get something identically equal. So all of the, almost every algebra move you made, unless you change both sides of the equation, you were getting an expression that was identically equal to the expression on the line before. So anytime you factor, distribute, combine like terms, you're, getting, you're rewriting the expression in a different form that's exactly the same or identically equal. So here's another example we've looked at in this class. We looked at sine squared plus cos squared is always 1. And that was true no matter where the point was on the unit circle. No matter what angle we were using, how much we spun around, either direction, if you add up x squared plus y squared or sine squared plus cos squared, you would always get 1 as that sum. So no matter what theta was, you would always get 1 if you added these two together. So it's a little bit strange because the left side has variables or one variable, the right side is just a single number, but no matter what theta you plug in on the left side, you're always going to get 1 out. So on the left side, you're always going to get the value 1. Of course, on the right side, obviously, you get the value 1, no matter what theta is. So I'm going to write down all the, um, ident the trig identities that we've written before. I'm just going to collect them all together in one spot. So we'll start with our quotient identities and the reciprocal identities. Let's start with secant. 1 over cosine theta. Cosecant is 1 over sine theta. Cotangent is 1 over tangent of theta. You can write tangent in terms of sines and cosines. So tangent is sine over cosine and of course cotangent theta is cosine over sine. So there's our quotient and reciprocal identities. Pythagorean identities, these are a little bit harder to remember. I just wrote one down squared plus sine squared equals 1. Tan squared theta plus 1 equals secant squared theta. And cotangent squared theta plus 1 is cosecant squared theta. So these are really all the trig identities we've seen so far. I'm going to write down the even and odd identities, and we're going to go and um, show why those are true. So the next column is even odd. So cos negative theta is cosine regular theta. I'm going to write the order a little bit differently. Secant negative theta is secant theta. And all the other trig functions are odd. So sine negative theta is negative sine theta. Cosecant negative theta is negative cosecant theta. Tan negative theta, negative tan theta. And last one, cotangent negative theta, negative cotangent theta. So these are the identities we're going to use. 
Now I'm going to talk about even and odd. I don't think I've said those words yet uh, with reference to functions. So we'll talk about even and odd before we start applying all these. So the first two are even, and the last four are odd. So what in the world do those mean? So even functions have the property that f of negative x is f of regular x. So why in the world do we call these even? The reason we call them even is because of this, the easiest even function example is the x squared function. So if you have uh, x squared, what happens if you take negative 1 and f it? Of course, neg I think negative 1, negative x is what I want to plug in, f of negative x. So this is our first example, is negative x squared. And two negatives multiplied together, that's just going to give us regular x squared. So those two negatives cancel each other out. You just get x squared. So this function f didn't care that the input was negative. It's going to give you the exact same output. And the word even comes from the polynomials. If you're, all your powers are even, you have an even function. So that's where that name comes from. So those are even functions. Odd functions. I'll use the letter G for these. Now, odd functions, you don't erase the negative. One way to think about it is a negative can be pulled through the function. And that seems like a weird thing or an odd thing. So that's, what, that's how I think of odd functions. They have this weird property that you can pull the negative sign through the function. Uh, and those are odd. And the example we'll look at, we'll look at the cube function. So again, power is odd. So what if I fed g a negative x? Now we have negative x cubed. which could be written as negative x times negative x times negative x, or negative x times negative x squared. And that negative x squared is just regular x squared. So this is negative x cubed. Or another way to think about it, three negatives multiplied together give you a negative. So this function will be odd right here. So that's a really fast review of even and odd functions. So we're going to look at our functions now. We'll start with the cosine function. So why is cosine even? So that means cosine negative theta is cosine theta. So cosine, if you have some angle, Cosine really cares about the x-coordinate, not the y-coordinate. So let's not worry about the y-coordinate at all. So we have some angle we measured theta. And let me write the x-coordinate. I don't care about the y-coordinate, so I'm just going to leave it blank. Don't worry about the y-coordinate. So if I told you this was theta right here, how would I draw a negative theta? What's the difference between theta and negative theta? Yep, the direction. So negative theta goes the same amount, but it goes the opposite direction. So draw your best negative theta here. Now, the y-coordinate certainly changes, but what happens to the x-coordinate here? It becomes stays the same. So it doesn't matter which way you rotate it, you're going to get the same x-coordinate. Well, that seems to work in the first quadrant. Let's think about the, uh, so if my theta was in quadrant two, 
if I rotated down here, then negative theta would be in quadrant one, and it would still have the same exact x value. I don't think they let me draw two things at the same time on the screen, so I'll just point up to the board here. Think about both of these points, increase the value of theta. So think about both of these points moving this direction at the same time, the exact same time. So if you make theta bigger, think about making negative theta grow the exact same amount. So when those points end up right here, they still have the exact same x value. So if theta keeps getting bigger, uh, as you enter quadrant two, you get the exact same x value you have down in quadrant three. So this is not a property that's unique to the first and second quadrant. So as much as you spin, no matter what, your x coordinate's gonna stay the same, regardless of which direction you spin in. And your y coordinate's gonna flip signs. So over here we would get whatever our x would be, it would be the same x value, but your y would be opposite sign. And that's why cosine doesn't care if you spun clockwise or counterclockwise you're going to end up at the same x-coordinate for cosine. So any questions on why cosine is even? It doesn't matter which direction you spin, you're going to get the same x-coordinate. Now when we look at uh, secant, do the same thing with secant, except instead of thinking about secant as 1 over x, I'll think about secant as 1 over cosine. Now I have to write secant of negative theta is one over cosine negative theta. And now I'm gonna use the identity above. Cos negative theta is just cos regular theta. And this is secant theta. So secant is based right off of cosine. It's one over cosine. Because cosine didn't care about the negative sign. Secant doesn't care about the negative sign either. So secant behaves the same way, they're both even. So that covers our two even functions. Now we're going to look at the other trig functions and we'll start with sine. And the good news is I don't have to change anything on my, on my unit circle here. All I'm going to do is just drop in the y values. So I talked about uh, the y values are the similar, they're not the same, they're similar. The only difference in spinning the wrong way is your y value is the opposite sign. So if I spun one way I'd have positive y, the other way I'd have negative y. And that is the odd property of sine. So if you spin the wrong way, the only difference is you'll get the opposite y coordinate, the opposite sign on the y coordinate compared to spinning the, the normal way. So that's what happens to sine, and of course the same thing happens over here. If that was your y coordinate, you would get negative y spinning the other way. So sine is odd, and the same thing happens to cosecant. Cosecant negative theta, it would look just like that above, except it would be one over sine negative theta and that turns into negative cosecant theta. And now we have tangent and cotangent to worry about. So we're gonna do is feed tangent a negative theta, and now I'm gonna write tangent in terms of sine negative theta over cos negative theta, and then use the even odd properties above on the board sine negative theta is negative sine theta, and cos negative theta is regular cos theta. So one of them became negative, the other one stayed positive. So this is negative tan theta. And cotangent is similar. I could write it as cosine over sine, or I could shortcut it and just write it as a reciprocal of tangent. And tangent is odd, so I can bring the negative outside. And this is negative one over tangent, which is negative cotangent theta. 
So there's the even odd properties of all six trig functions. So I'm going to write down some strategies. I think there's going to be five strategies total. So I want you to leave a bunch of space on your page because we're going to come back and write more strategies as we use them. Let's leave space for six. I think there's only five, but I just want to be sure. So make sure in your notes you leave some space here. So our first strategy is write, actually we'll, I'll write this as a second strategy. Write in terms of sine and cosine. So our first example, so make sure again you leave space, we're gonna write probably about five more strategies down. So leave like a third of a page or so. So we're gonna simplify cotangent x over cosecant x. The only strategy we have is write in terms of sine and cosine. So I'm gonna rewrite cotangent as cos x over sine x. That comes from our reciprocal identity before. Cosecant is one over sine x. And what do we do anytime we have multi-story fraction? Yeah, multiply by a reciprocal of the denominator. So we're going to do that. 